Yeah. Hello. Hello. Hello, everybody. We're happy to have Madeline Hoffman here with us tonight. And Madeline, Hi. I want to talk about you. I'm sure people know you. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I guess I'll just say that um, I've been a lifelong activist for peace, but I was the director of a peace organization, nonprofit peace organization from the year 2000 to the year 2018. Um, and I'm still an advocate for peace whenever and wherever I can be. Um, and I like to travel to the places where, you know, that are under attack or under occupation in order to see for myself what's really going on instead of listening to the mainstream media describe it. Um, because as we all know, the mainstream media has a, I think just a little bit of a bias when it comes to some of these issues. Exactly. So yeah. I'm really, I'm really grateful that you, you know, that you've welcomed me onto your show. We're so happy to have you here. So do you want to get into telling us, Mr. Loris, more about yeah, you want to put, how do we put it on the screen? We put up um, about the show tonight and. Okay. Give me one moment. Let me get that pulled up. Oh, you sent to me in the other chat. And I put them both in the same chat. Hmm. It will be talking about Fatima Bernawi. And uh, she led a, um, I'd say, an extraordinary life. Um, the horror that happened to her at the age of nine years old when um, the Balfour document happened and um, she was just fighting for her freedom, fighting for Palestine her entire life, that what happened in the separation, you know, the situation with her family, changed her forever. Yeah, yeah. this was a woman, um, I think she deserves a whole lot of recognition and I'm really glad we're talking about her tonight. It's, you know, she's someone that I had not really, I had not known about before tonight. So this is, I think a life, an extraordinary life it is, Dolores, and well, glad we're sharing some information about. Okay. So, do you want me to start off with reading this article? Sure. Okay. Let me see if I can share around a bit too. All right. And Palestinians yesterday mourned Fatima Berniwa. We, I'm. Hoping I'm pronouncing that correctly. I apologize if I'm not. The first woman to be in prison by Israel who died at the age of 83 in Egypt yesterday. The Palestinian news Wafa reported. The Fatah movement began in Egypt issued an official statement mourning Bernawi. Saying she had died following years of resistance during which she was an exceptional model for Palestinian women. Bernali joined the Fatah movement when she was 18, following in the footsteps of her father, who took part in the 1936 Arab Revolution in Palestine and was an active fighter during the Palestinian Freedom Movement in the 1960s. In 1967, Bernawi was arrested and became the first Palestinian woman to be imprisoned in Israel. She was released on November 11th of 1979 and then exiled to Lebanon before returning to the Gaza Strip in 1994, leading the women's police force. Bernawi will remain a historical mark in the history of the Palestinian national struggle, Fatah said. 
the movement's leaders and cadres will continue their struggle until the national rights that Bernie Nawi fought for. Represented by the establishment of an independent sovereign Palestine state with Jerusalem as its capital are achieved. Bernawi was born in Jerusalem in 1939 to a Nigerian father and a Jordanian Palestinian mother. In 1948, she moved with her family to Jordan before she returned to Jerusalem in 1960 where she settled. Bernawi was the wife of the late freedom fire fighter Fawazi al Nimr, who passed away last year. In 2015, Abbas award, awarded Bernawi as the Military Star of Honor. So. Amazing. Yeah, it, it is. And I guess I'm, you know, the fact that many of us never really heard of her, learned of her, were able to be inspired by her, is, is tra tragic, really. I don't know in, in Palestine, it's, uh, hopefully it's different there, and the Palestinians are well aware of her, um, but people around the world should know. They should know about her. Yeah. Um, I just can't even imagine, you know, that life, you know, just her whole life. You, you don't know what, how a life would have been had this not occurred, mm. you know, because it was a, just the big part of her life. You know, we've got to get our country back. Well, and, and she's not, obviously she's not alone in this. And, you know, there are, there are, hundreds if not thousands if not millions of palestinians who still have that resolve um, yes. and that that desire to resist and i don't know that that the world understands that and understands why you know it's because from everything i've ever heard or seen palestinians say they'll never give up they'll never give up and because it was their land, it was their homeland. Um, and I mean, the stories of people being, their families being separated and, and the Nara people being pushed out and expelled from their country and being promised a right of return, but never having it. Um, how can, I mean, it, it, you're right, Dolores. I mean, it, how can, it's got to be really hard to live with that. Um, right, and being locked, it's like you're locked up and everybody is against you. It's like you're screaming and screaming and no one's listening. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I read something from a, a resident of Palestine. I think I still have it around someplace. He said we, we, would, we would have been better off as puppies or kittens because if puppies or kittens were crammed into a box the way we've been, the world would be up in arms, uh, would be outraged by it because of their concern for puppies and kittens. But mm -hmm. because we're Palestinians, we're not, we're treated as less than, you know, puppies or kittens. I thought that was, when I read that, I was, it was heartbreaking, but true. Mm -hmm. Oh, sorry. I forgot I was sharing the screen. I went to look at something. Uh, all right. So this is another article, and this, I think, goes into more detail. Yes. On Thursday, the 3rd of November, Palestinian struggler and liberated prisoner Fatima Barnawi, the first Palestinian woman prisoner of the modern Palestinian revolutionary era and a prominent afro-palestinian fig palestinian figure passed away in the palestinian hospital in cairo egypt at mm -hmm. the age of 83 bernawi was a round renowned 
as a symbol of Palestinian women's participation and the participation of Palestinians of Africa descent in the armed struggle and Palestinians prisoners movement. Bernari was born in Jerusalem in 1939 to her Nigerian father and Palestinian mother. And in 1948, she was forced into a refugee camp near Amen with her mother before returning to Jerusalem, where her father had remained. In 1960, they lived in the African quarter of Jerusalem. At the age of nine, Bernari had earlier smuggled herself into Jerusalem to reunite with her father. Bernari's father had been an active participant in the 1936 and 1939 revolution of Palestinian and in the defense of Palestinian during al Nakba. And she had become an early member of the newly formed Fatah movement. Renari worked as a UNRWA nurse in <coughs> I'm sorry, I apologize for not knowing how to pronounce this name properly. Which name so, I can't I can't see it. And it just do you see Alkilia, something like that? Yeah, Alkilia. During the 1967 occupation and saw firsthand the impacts of the Zionist onslaught at the West mm. Bank of Palestine. Mm. She would later declare that she undertook armed struggle because you destroyed in a statement to the interrogators who held her word or who held her. She was on one of the first women to plan an armed operation in Palestine. The attempted bombing of a cinema screening film celebrating the occupation of 1967 Jerusalem. She and fellow women freedom fighters left behind in a, ha a handbag containing an explosive. Although it was found before it being detonated, she was seized by the occupation forces on the 19th of October 1967 and became the first Palestinian woman political prisoner of the contemporary Palestinian revolution. She was sentenced to 30 years in prison and was released on the 11th of November 1977 in a prisoner release agreement. She was exiled to Jordan and then Lebanon under the exchange terms. Where she, where she returned to the Palestinian Revolution as a member of social organizations, she later returned to Gaza in 1994 and lived with her husband, fellow liberated prisoner Fawazi Al Nimer, who mm -hmm. died last year. Well, she and Al she and Al Nimer had lit, have lived in Cairo for the past several years. Al Nimer, who had been a, a fighter with the Akawi group mm -hmm. that targeted specific Zionist military installations, served over 15 years in the occupied, occupation prisons with his comrades, and he was freed in an exchange with the Palestinian resistance in May of 1985. It says her sister, Anam Bernawi, was jailed for one year alongside her sister during Fatima 
Catherine Henry's time in the occupied prisons. She was jailed with the fellow Palestinian woman freedom fighter Zakia Shemount, who was pregnant and gave birth in, in her prison cell. Accompanied by her fellow women prisoners as a trained nurse, Renari cut the cord, the umbilical cord, and ensured the life and health of Shemount and her daughter, Nadia. Wow. Isn't that amazing? Yes. That, yeah. Yes. Well, I, I tell you, we often don't give nurses enough credit. My daughter, my youngest daughter, was delivered by an ICU nurse. Mm -hmm. So, and then the doctor made it down just in time to deliver her twin, my son. Oh, wow. But yeah, but considering the circumstances mm -hmm. yes. of being in prison and your cellmate, who's a nurse who's in prison with you, is the one providing your medical care and the medical care for an infant. And there would have been no care. There would have been no care otherwise. No, there would yeah. have been. The conditions for women in prisons um, are, are abominable. Mm -hmm. um, not that they're that much better for men, but... Um, right. But, but for women, it's, uh, they're abominable. And then I guess if you are Palestinian, it's even worse. Um, but, you know, she was, obviously, she was a lifesaver here. And yeah. she, Her whole life just amazes me, everything she went through. Yeah. Wow. Well, yeah, and she worked the... UNRWA, for people who don't know, UNRWA, where she worked as well, that's a United Nations organization that works with refugees. And, you know, part of part of the issue in, in Palestine is that people were pushed, as, as you read, uh, Brandy, for, about the, the Nakba and people getting pushed out of their homes and pushed out of their country. They were supposed to have a right to return. These were supposed to be, quote unquote, temporary refugee camps so that, you know, people, because people could return, should have been allowed to return to where they had lived before. And that just never, never happened. People are still, the Palestinians are still fighting for it. Um, the United Nations isn't helping with it. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, uh, you're dealing with people who are, who become permanent refugees and, yeah. and that's technically against international law, the under occupation, the occupying power is supposed to improve the lives, not make the lives harder or worse on the people that, that you know, they're occupying. So anyway, there's a lot of issues here. I'm, I'm straying off a little bit from the life of this woman, but um, it's just, it's just, she has to have, she was so strong, you know, mm -hmm. committed to her, like, like you said, Randy, committed to helping and she would help wherever she could. Yeah. I mean, I can't imagine being forced out of my home with nowhere to go and she was nine years old when that happened yeah. and who knows what happened when she was living in the camp. Oof. Yeah. Well, and being I mean, I, that young and hungry. Yes. yes. I mean, I, I, I visited a camp in, uh, in Ramallah on, on the West Bank. I was uh, in one in 2013, in December of 2013. So it's a while ago now. Um, but I've never forgotten it. I, I feel like I was there yesterday because the, the living conditions... You're forever edge. You never know what might happen. 
who might barge in, you know, what soldiers or what just set, what settlers will just walk into the refugee camp with a rifle or a yeah. gun, you know, and unfortunately when that happens, um, usually the people who uh, perpetrate the shooting or kill, they, they walk, they walk away scot-free. It's you know, so, so the tension is there, the risk is there, and there's virtually no accountability that might happen to you. And so people are living in that constant state of, constant state of fear and trying, trying, having parties because daughters get engaged, trying to go to law school or medical, to live as quote unquote normal a life as possible in the middle of that terrible tension and great risk. What was that? You never know they're going to be terrorized, you know, when they're going to come in yes. and attack. It's like a constant state of PTSD. Yes, constant. Because, yeah. and, and, or if, if someone of the, one of the young people who live in the household is just accused of something, no proof, but accused, it could be that the IDF will come in to the refugee camp and demolish the home that the parents and family live in. They collect like, another violation of international law, collective punishment. You're not, that's not supposed to be the way this goes, but this is, you know, the story of people's lives in occupied Palestine. They can get punished for the, for an alleged violation. That's, that's the first part. And then collective punishment for an alleged violation. It's, I'll, I'll be quiet now. <laughs> I'm and this new, no, and there's no court system for them. Yeah. Uh, no. You're always going to be guilty. That's correct. That's correct. That's correct. Um, well, at least, you know, with having you here, Madeline, and you speaking mm -hmm. about what you saw when you were there, you've actually been over there. Yeah, and, and you know, I'll, I'll say this, too. Um, when I first got, I was in Hebron, the, the, or Al-Khalil, Al and when I first got there, my one of my hosts said, we don't have a centimeter's worth of space in which to move. And in the back of my mind, I said, oh, really, centimeter? You're, you're exact, you know, I, the, the doubt comes in. You're, you're exaggerating. Uh-uh. He was absolutely right because of that, set, that possibility that at any minute, whether you're a school child, if you're a school kid, you know, 12 years old with a backpack coming home from school. There's a, um, a farmer who's trying to collect, the, to harvest the olives off the olive trees. Doesn't matter. You know, you could be, you could be accosted. You could be attacked at any minute, thrown to the ground, whatever. And then there was one spot. Um, I came down the hill where my, where my host was, where he lived, come down the hill to the main street. It's called Al Shahuda Street um, that, that runs through that part of Hebron. And once upon a time, that was a thriving business district, end to end with Palestinian shops and Palestinian homes. And now more than half of it's abandoned. But even worse than that, if there's a there's a temple, a synagogue at the bottom of the hill and a guard sitting in, sitting in front of, of that synagogue. If I walked to the right on that street, I would be fine. If my friend, Palestinian, walked to the right on that street, he would be shot. I mean, the apartheid is so... Oh, my God. It's so thick, right? You, 
I I always thought that I knew what was going on in in Palestine. I was enlightened. I was not. I was still, you know, under the impression that things were oh maybe not quite as bad as they were made out to be. They're far worse. And the apartheid in in Palestine is deep and wide and that adds obviously that adds to the tension. Um and um, mm -hmm. I was saying to Dolores earlier, when I came back, I was explaining to my friends what had happened in three days, that's it. Three days is all I was there. And I was explaining to them what I had seen and what had happened in the three days. You sound like you have PTSD. Three days, mm -hmm. and it's still like a, like a metal pole going through my stomach, you know, that, that sense of, of being under attack and outrage all the time, all the time. Mm -hmm. And now as we're talking, it was almost 10 years ago. And it, feel, it still feels like it was yesterday. One thing I want to point oh, out is this is why I understand why so many of our um, black people feel a connection with the Palestinians. Yes. Because of what they've been through as well. And, you know, they, the government that is committing this learned it from somebody else and I want to kind of because we always try to bring something back home mm -hmm. on every episode when mm -hmm. white settlers came to America what did they do hmm. we exactly. raped, slaved killed murdered the indigenous groups that were here stole and mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we stole the land it sounds and, very familiar right <laughs> yeah it, it very much does and you know if you look back at when this all happened and what was it 1940 something <laughs> 49. 49. Um, Britain and America made the arrangement for the Jewish settlement to go to Palestine. So we colon colonized them and taught them how to be colonizers in a sense they are not doing anything to them that we haven't done to people of color in our country well and it wasn't we look at it it wasn't Balfour's um the foreign minister Balfour wasn't his decision you know his decision to do this what right did he have to say yeah. okay we're just going to do this my declaration we have we're We've had enough of the situation. They were supposed to be providing, you know, protection for the Palestinian people. That was British's um, job. But then what I read, it was so much with World War Two, and it was just too much. And you had the groups in there, the Zionist groups in there, terrorizing, and so much going on. They just kind of like put their hands up and said, "Here, just, just you know." Yeah. Well, and you signed this declaration. We've heard so often about the strategies of divide and conquer, and um, the Brits, yeah. the British, were masters at that. Um, not only oh, yeah. in um, in Israel, Palestine, but also in Pal uh, Pakistan and Kashmir. You know, if you if you can't control mm -hmm. them anymore, you've got to withdraw, pit them against one another, and let them. You know, let them work it out, quote unquote, work it out that way. The last 
and standing and you wash your hands of it. Um, and but you know when you said it wasn't it wasn't Brit Britain's land or US land to give away. Remember when when uh, was it Trump? Yeah, I think it was Trump who went to Jerusalem and said, Jerusalem is the capital of Israel. And it set off it set off protests and rebellions. Yeah, like, in, yeah. <laughs> who are we to give it to, to just again by declaration? We say this is oh yeah. infuriating. Yeah. yeah, and look at you know, like setting each other up against one another. When we look at America, look at throwing all everybody over here and just tell them to come over here. There's, there's land here. There's land here. Go, go, populate it. Never telling people that there were people living here, you know? Yes, yeah, well, wasn't that one of, you were talking about narratives before. Part of the narrative is, oh, but there was nobody here before we got to Palestine. Or it was just a desert, you know, a yeah. dry, infertile desert, and we made it bloom. Um, well... Let's look at history for real. Let's look at who was there. Look at their the lemon trees and you know all the things that that made up these communities before. Kind of like looking at the old pictures of Iran. Yeah, what do you mean? Um, when we got, we're the ones that toppled the Iranian government. Oh, okay, yeah. And so before that, before the women had to wear the headdresses and everything, and before they had their current government, we had Saddam take out the leader of them. Mm -hmm. And we, even before we that. armed Saddam Hussein to take out the leader of the Iranian government. Well, Who then we yeah. later took out in our Saddam. decades later. It's also that seems to be the playbook. Yeah, yeah. 1953, the U.S. and Great Britain together overthrew democratically elected Mossadegh um, because mm -hmm. there were people in Great Britain and elsewhere who said how, you know, he wants to nationalize the oil. Um, we can't have that. And so, you know, that was the beginning of meddling there. Oh, do we love to then we get so angry when we, when we think someone's meddling in our affairs. We're, oof. But we're doing it to them. Yeah. I, oh no, you just drop your mouth. <laughs> yeah. Um recently I used to love watching a, a YouTube series called Adam Ruins Everything by Adam Conover. He's mm. actually interviewed and done a recent interview with somebody about what was going on in Iran right now. And he went, they went back to the history of everything that we were involved in doing mm -hmm. with the cooing them. Mm -hmm. And so that just brought me a whole new respect for him, you know, to be speaking out like that mm -hmm. and ha talking that truth of what happened. So sometime, one of these days, I'll find uh, Adam Rune's Everything video that goes along with our theme, our discussion mm -hmm. for the night, right. and show you those. And you'll see why he was one of my favorites to watch. What kind of show is that? I never heard yeah, of that. That sounds great. Um, it's a little short clip, and he plays this really nerdy guy that this other couple will be talking about something and then he jumps in. Ah. He's done some great videos on the healthcare system as well and the problems with it. 
So Adam ruins everything. Adam ruins everything. <laughs> it was pre, it was pre pandemic. Uh huh. Uh-huh. So, but now, okay. um, so I want to get back to the article a little bit. Yes. So while Benari was the first Palestinian woman prisoner of the contemporary post-1967 Palestinian revolution, she was always certain to cite fellow Palestinian women who had been jailed in the two decades of the occupation prior, including many women detained and held in forced labor camps Mm. and subjected to harsh violence by occupational soldiers during the Nakba, as well as the notable Palestinians like Ilkhas Ali, jailed for teaching children revolutionary songs in Palestine 1948. And Nefei Akila, a member of the Al Art Group, one of the first Palestinian revolutionary organizations formed by the Nakba, mm-hmm. accused of sharing military information about Zionist forces with Syria with the Syrian army in 1956. And we still see fights between Israel and Syria to this day. Oh, yeah. Oh, yes, we do. (laughs) And we see false narratives there, too. Yeah. One journalist who interviewed Bernari recalled that she discussed a memorable interaction with Omar al Qasim the imprisoned leader of the Democratic Front for the Liberation of Palestine, who was renowned for his role in sparking Palestinian armed resistance. Inside the occupied West Bank of Palestine, as well as for his later leading role in the prisoners' movement, both she and al Qasim were brought by occupation soldiers where several Palestinian resistance fighters were holding up Zionist military trainees hostage. While she, while prison guards demanded to use a, micro, a megaphone to call on the fighters to let the soldiers go, Bernari refused to speak through the megaphone at all. While al took up the megaphone and instead called for the fighters to carry through with the orders of their leadership. al Qasim was beaten and dragged away by occupation forces. Following weeks of appeals by his family for his freedom. Along with Dalai al Mugrabi. And again, I apologize. I'm probably butchering these names. That one you did pretty well with. <laughs> with some of them. Mm-hmm. With Sh- yeah. Shadia Abu Gazalea, Leela Khaled Bernari remained a symbol of Palestinian women's steadfastness and commitment by all the members to liberate their homeland from the river to the sea. In fact, Bernawi met Dalal al Magrabi before she led her commando operation to the occupied Palestine. Although she was not aware of the operation planned, Al Mugrabi told Bernawi, I am going to the place you come from, you came from. Bernawi understood the full meaning of Al Mugrabi's word. When she received the news that the commando operation and her martyrdom. Fellow freed prisoner Aisha Ode saluted Bernari 
on Facebook saying goodbye Fatima Bernari, daughter of Jerusalem and great fighter, the first to seek freedom and dignity and refuse defeat. She became a beacon for us all, guiding us on the path of struggle. I don't think you're going to be able to read what comes next. <laughs> it's uh, all, in Arabic, all in Arabic. Yeah. But I guess it's translated underneath it. Put up just two to commemorate her. Yeah. Amazing it, people she met in the life, a life of struggle. Well, and and then you notice too, she died in Cairo. She died yeah. in a in a hospital in Egypt. She never did get back. Well, as I guess part of the. The terms of her release, she was exiled, but there are so many Palestinians who were not in that position, who have not gotten back to uh, to Palestine, and they die miles away from where they were born, where they lived. Um, they some who you know want to go back to visit dying parents, or you know they're just the. Families are split, and people are um, carrying the burden of that of that separation throughout all of their lives. Mm -hmm. uh, people that are treated like they're not even human, that they have no feelings, that they're you know, it's it's just so horrible and shocking that people are treated like that. And for what reason? It, it well, makes and, no sense. You yeah. know, I had family who were wiped out during the Holocaust. I had family in Lithuania. And, mm -hmm. you know, part of me, well, not a part of me, all of me would be believed or wants to believe that if you're a victim of... Holocaust, of genocide, of terrible violence like that, that you would turn around and be different and, mm -hmm. you know, to other people that you encounter. And it seems it's just, at, at what point, I, I've, I've been writing about this issue for 10 years, 12 years, and I, I wrote a letter to my, to my late great aunt, and I said, is this what you had in mind, you know, as a Zionist? Is this what you wanted? Did you, is this what you envisioned? I mean, I loved her. And she was generous and had a big heart, but the way she was toward the Arab people and what happened to the, to the country she, st she helped to found in the, in the late, in the 1930s and early 1940s, how could she... How could she stand it? How could she tolerate it? Um, especially after what's happened to Jews around the world. There is a exactly. psychology of abuse. And you'll, you find it a lot in families where mul there's been abuse multiple generations, that there's a psychology of abuse. And I'm not putting like anything that they've done because you have a choice whether to continue the abuse or not. Exactly. So that's something like with exactly. my family. Exactly. You want to be Yeah. With my family it was my generation that stopped the abuse that went on. Mm. And it we decided it's not gonna go on with our kids. And we pretty much exiled the people who my kids didn't grow up knowing those relatives mm. that did harm and mm. so but that's the thing is you've got to make that choice 
just because it was done to you doesn't mean it's okay to do some to somebody else. And that's where I find exactly. myself in this. So it's hard. Yeah, well, yes. And I mean, this, and and this was, this was a genocide, you know, mm -hmm. and, and yeah. the genocide, first the genocide, the Holocaust of Jewish people, and now genocide of Palestinians, little by little, by little, by little, and sometimes not by little. You yeah, know, sometimes major. Yeah. We've seen them. And with, and with children and you know, people, children being killed. This was back in 2014 um, with the op the um, bombing of Gaza. And, you know, I, I have a friend who said, I guess I haven't seen him in a little while, but I know he's living, still living in. And he said, if you were, let's see, if you were born in 2014 or, you know, before, between 20, 2000, to 2014 or 2000 to 2015 in Palestine, you'd already lived through something like three of these major operations. And so what trauma is being, mm -hmm. you know, is being experienced by the, by the children? You want to draw what's happening in Gaza, draw what's happening in your village. See airplanes, you see bombs, you see fires and buildings, exploding buildings, buildings, you know, burning to the ground. I mean, what kind of, I mean, if it were anywhere, if it were here, and then, well, I maybe not. If it, <laughs> I, I <laughs> honestly, that's one of my biggest frustrations is, you know, certain people griping about issues, and it's like, especially that you know people who are against the anti-war movement mm -hmm. you go live over there mm -hmm. go to libya go to syria go to somalia mm -hmm. to where they deal with that on a regular basis yemen oh yemen I'm glad um, you mentioned yemen mm -hmm. and i you know, people are so dehumanized. I, I follow someone on Facebook, a really nice man from Yemen, and he's always posting photographs from Yemen. Beautiful buildings, beautiful countryside, beautiful people. You know, if he can do it, so could our so could our media. Our media could show those beautiful, the beautiful architecture, the, you know, the mountains where you can climb up to the top. No, I wouldn't dare because they're so tall, they're so high, and I would be terrified, you know. But show us images of the places where people are being, where people's lives are being decimated. That would, I think, that would shift people's sentiment, say, you know, to make them anti war, make, make more people anti war. but. Our media don't do that. No, they don't. That's what beautiful history, history of buildings, and how old buildings are, and just why them for reason. Yeah, there's no reason to do what you want. It's going around terrorizing the world, and you know, you look at Syria, and you know, the whole East, and the history is destroying the total. Destruction. People didn't ask all this. You know, Britain and the USA getting involved, you know, with corporate, corporate profit stuff. And it's hard. You know, for oil. Well, there's oil there. Wouldn't have been, you know, look at how history would have been different. Yeah. Hmm. Well, Donna, they don't have to be. But um, that would be one way to do it. Yeah, I mean, that empathy is something that we should, that people, sh I always thought people had naturally, you know, it's like an, a, a human tra trait, human characteristic. 
but it's beaten, been beaten out of so many of us. I don't know. They, they should all be every person, no matter who, mm -hmm. should be treated with dignity and respect, not mm -hmm. dehumanized. That's it. Yes. Yeah. Every person, I don't care where you're born. I don't care when you were born. Everyone deserves dignity and respect. Mm -hmm. And everybody deserves um, a safe and sound environment to live in and thrive. Absolutely. Exactly. Absolutely. And now there's, you know, another you know, 2014 in the children. So here we have again, we have to fat in her whole life. So now you have a whole generation. You're having from her generation on and on and on. And they, people just want to live peace. They just want a house. They want right. food. They want peace. Education, health care. They're not asking much. Yeah. You know, this occupation. Mm -hmm. It's terrific. It's people are screaming, help me, help me, help me. And the world knows about it, but everybody's handcuffed. Most of us, I mean, obviously the people on top can do something, and they're not. And that's what I'm hoping with bricks, that with bricks, that, may, that things will change, that somehow yeah. things can be changed. I am hoping that that does happen. It's hard to trust any leader or politician <laughs> at all and uh, you know we know everything ours is done because we know history we've seen it in our own history and i want to trust that things will change with bricks and i hope it does i just yes I, but I do see the brick system taking over as the world dominant economy. Yes. Yes, I see that. And then that speech that I shared to you, I'm sorry, the speech I shared to you uh, with Amran Khan and bringing up with Palestine and, and it's just like the Arab world, everybody just stands back. I think there's that power over them to try to do something with Palestine. Yeah. And well, everybody was all together with Palestine, but you got the forces that be are the, are the problem. And how many times has, you know, Palestine been rebuilt? People keep rebuilding, thing, rebuilding, rebuilding, and re rebuilding, and it keeps getting bombed and bombed and bombed. Yeah. But if we can listen to what Ivan Khan had said, that little video I sent in the mm -hmm. chat. Yeah. yeah, my dogs are in here right now. They just wanted to stop in to see what I was doing. I mean, and we need to, we need to, as a country, you know, we need to examine our hypocrisy. It just, it leaks throughout the world. It just... You, you have people jumping up and down, you know, saying, are you talking, well, you know, there should be no, Russia's occupying, occupying Ukraine, all right? And what about United States, Israel, you know, United States supporting Israeli occupation of Palestine? Do we hear anything about that? No, it's it's swept under the rug, swept under the rug like it doesn't even exist. Oh, give me one more. Except all these years, all the decades, people live like patient. Yeah, and I look back our whole life. I mean, in Ukraine, within ten days, the building was blue and yellow. And yet Palestine has been since 1948. Where is that kind of international solidarity for what's going on? Yeah, there? but it's the outcome. It, it, it. Anyway. Okay. 
Well, that's what I say. Where's the air fryer? You know, when you get the world. Uh, what can do? Yeah. Palestinians and the people of Kashmir. We have been able to make no impact at all. We are 1.5 billion people. And yet, our voice to stop this blatant injustice is insignificant. And I mean, it's daylight robbery going on in Palestine. In Kashmir, it's a war crime according to the Fourth Geneva Convention, to change the demography of an occupied land. Unless we have a united front, these abuses will happen. We are not talking about conquering some country. We are simply talking about the human, the human rights of the people of Kashmir and Palestine, the international law, which is on their side. Yeah. Right on. Right on. I just find it yeah, so odd that everyone's got so much fear of us in NATO mm -hmm. that they're afraid to stand up. But they are because we've been the leading superpower next to Britain throughout most of history. Well, I think we're really, the U.S. is really hang on, though. It, we're probably at the point where, where Great Britain was, or, you know, England was way back, well, 1948, 1947. When, when they withdrew um, from places around the world and their empire started to crumble. The problem is that the propaganda is so thick from this country that people don't understand that this is an empire that's crumbling. And yeah. instead, instead, you know, the, the flames of war, they're, we're, we're fueling them constantly and we really are at a time when a nuclear war could take to, could take place. The more we we send weapons to Ukraine, more weapons and weapons and weapons. And now and we've got and weapons. Mm -hmm. Now we've got our military there. Yes, yes. It sounds like Vietnam too, right? The first the advisors, and then the and then and then and then. Um, why don't we try something? Like those thirty Democrats, I, I, whoever you said that you don't trust politicians anymore. Those Democrats had the weakest kind of letter going to Biden, saying, "Keep sending weapons and keep sending money, but negotiate for peace at the same time." They had to withdraw yeah. that. Yeah, exactly. They got, they got, <laughs> They got slammed, and that's to me just shows you where we are. You know, yeah. um, it's, it's sad though. It's really uh, it makes me really disappointed and sad for this being the country I was born in that yeah. we're this way and we've had this history and we haven't learned yet. No, and we haven't figured it out yet, and it's going to be our downfall. Death. And the violence our own country with putting people in, in prison, the prison industrial complex for profit. Yeah. Mm. So we harass our own citizens. Yeah. And oh, then create laws. The jails can be full, 90% full. And we're using some of the weaponry that we don't that that was sent first to iraq for example or libya we're using some of the some of the department of defense is literally giving it away to some municipalities and counties throughout the country remember back in in um i don't know okay i'm not when uh, michael brown was killed um by police um and there, that iconic photograph of a woman holding her hand up, you know, and, and 
right in the face of a tank with a long cannon attached to it. That was a military that was used in the military overseas. Then it was brought to the United States and turned against our own people. You know, it's democracy, right? And that wasn't that what Joe Biden said the other day? Midterms midterm elections are a referendum on democracy. I just want to scream. Really we are. Yeah. Um, Can we put some speaking pictures of, up? So this is my own city. Yeah. Wow. We have one. I think our mm. population is less than 2,000. Well, when did you get that? When did that arrive? Uh, this was 2019. So right oh. before the pandemic. Wow. And they used it for Halloween to uh, pass out candy to kids. Oh, no. God. Yeah. That's sinister, so, man. That's sinister. Very rarely does anything happen in our town. Honestly. Most of the time you hear sirens, it's a car accident. Hmm. And so it's not something that I feel that is needed. Uh, no. I don't, I Absolutely. mean, honestly, they're not supposed to use military ve vehicles on our streets to begin with. Correct. Police no. aren't. And this is what's going on everywhere. And mine is a majority white town. Mm. So, yeah. Ferguson, Missouri. I'm sorry. I I blanked out on the name for a moment. A senior moment. Um, Ferguson, Missouri. And wh what's the name of your town? Prairie Grove? Prairie Grove, Arkansas. There's Arkansas. actually, yeah. There's actually a lot of towns throughout the entire U.S. that have gotten yes. these vehicles. Some of them are even from the Gulf Wars. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, but to then you think against money hmm? to be used against our own citizens. Beacon of democracy that we are. <laughs> exactly. I'm sharing this photo because I loved it. Oh yeah. That you said. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. So. Yeah, and I, I remember just, the Palestinians standing up for Michael Brown and Ferguson as well. Remember mm -hmm. that I think they sent pizzas. They sent pizzas to the people out in the streets. Yeah. That's an yeah. amazing. Yes. Because there's the ability to empathize. Yes. Mm -hmm. Everything they've been through, you recognize what's happening over here. Mm -hmm. And that's another thing where I've heard that, like, some of our police train with some of the Israeli military as well. So, yes. And in Colombia, in South America, mm -hmm. um, some of the security, worst security. The most violent security forces are trained by, by Israelis as well. And during the national strike of last year, there were some times I was looking at video from Colombia, and I couldn't tell whether it was Colombia or Palestine or maybe, mm -hmm. you know, streets of the United States. You know, very similar tactics being used. Yeah. Mm. That's a, just a great photo. Yeah, and I'm seeing so many of the South and Central American countries now. Like, a lot of them are going left. Yes. Yes. A lot of them are going left, and it's 
it makes me so happy for them because I've got friends that are from those countries who mm -hmm. I've seen their struggles and, but it makes me so disappointed in our country mm -hmm. at the same time. Mm -hmm. I'm like, I'm happy for them, but I'm disappointed in mine. Yeah. And yet, you know, as grassroots movements in this country, we can take inspiration from yep. what the people of uh, South America, Central America are doing and, and connect because our issues, I'm sure, you know, our issues are interconnected for sure. It's the same multinational corporations. Mm -hmm. It's the same profit motive. It's the same quote unquote war on drugs. That's really just a war on poor people. Um, yeah. You know, so it's the same if we if we can find ways to build bridges across across uh, country lines. Um, it's the same fight. And, yeah. Uh, well, that's what Angela Davis was talking about too, in regard to Palestine and the United States, wasn't she? She has a book about that, I think. I'm not sure. I'll have to look that one up. Yeah, I, I'm. I'm going to take a quick peek. Um, something about the struggle of occupation. But let me let me look while. Uh, yeah, I'll show another one. Yes, I look at her young and beautiful in her whole life. Uh huh. Yeah, it's too bad that you have to have courage and bravery to stand up for human rights. And, you know, it should just be the normal course of events. Uh. Yeah, and, um, you know, I'm I think the more of us that stand up, and I don't care if you're in a supposed blue state or a supposed red state, the more of us that stand up, the more we'll see our own power. Whereas right now, so, so many people are just so weak. They say we can't do it. Yeah, the name and of the book. We look at her. We look at Adam. Yeah. So go ahead. Yeah, we can. No, I was just saying we look at at uh, Fatima Banawi, and we look at how powerful and strong the strong woman she became. You know, the little girl that grew up and how powerful. You know, she her, her entire life. I mean, we look at her as she's a symbol of strength. Yep. And power, you know, we can. Very true. Yeah, the book is Freedom is a Constant Struggle, and it compares uh, Ferguson, Palestine, and, um, oh, let me get the rest of it here. Um, yeah. Um, Ferguson, Missouri, Palestine, and other places around the world, kind of drawing the connections. And the book is Freedom is a Constant Struggle. And uh, yeah. unfortunately, that's that's true. I'm... And we need to recognize that Constant more, struggle. that we have more in common with people who they try to say are our enemies than we don't. I mm -hmm. consider every human on this planet my brother or sister. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And that's the way it needs to be because um, we can outnumber them. We can. Oh, we do. Yeah, we do. We just, oh, not even yeah, yeah, people we, will recognize it. Yeah, true. True. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, things are hitting a tipping point right now when people start losing their power. We're not having the blackouts in the winter and the fuel shortage, energy shortage, um, food shortage. I mean, people, things 
to wake people up. It's going to be rough on Western Europe. Yes. I think really bad. Um, I mm-hmm. dread. And that's not okay because the people there don't deserve it either. For what? No. A pissing contest between two. Well, a pissing contest that our country started. Um, mm-hmm. Didn't we end the Cold War? Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> we're That's what we allegedly, told right? Everybody. Yeah, we were supposed to have, but it's it's back out. And there's, you know, that was uh, the Cuban Missile Crisis was 60, 60 years ago, I believe. Um, yeah, 1963, and uh, we're 2000, we're almost 2023. Am I right with the date? 62 or 63? That's 60 years or so. What I mean, in, in the Cuban Missile Crisis, there were some negotiations that went on, and there was some ability to talk to each other, to talk to each other. And a way to resolve it where everybody came out, you know, all the leaders came out looking okay to their people. Um, We've forgotten what diplomacy is. We've forgotten how to negotiate. We refuse to negotiate in this situation between Ukraine and, and Russia. We've let people go in and tell Ukraine they can't. No, they're not. We're not going to accept negotiations. They actually Why? had negotiated within like the first couple of days after the war started and mm-hmm. we went in and told them no yeah. that's not acceptable that just sends chills up and down my spine uh-huh. because you know, so it's not, mm. Ukrainian people are dying because of us not allowing them to make choose to make a, an agreement for their own country. Mm-hmm. And that is and so is- wrong. Who are we? Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. Well, yeah, there's a good, there's a book that was written by one of our former national one of our one of the u.s's former national security advisors and i don't know talk about not being able to pronounce the name but it's it's a big new brzezinski i believe and the name of the book was the grand or the great chessboard you know and for anybody in political power Mm -hmm. to look at others as just pawns in a game of chess um, and to think that we have the right to pull the strings or make the moves, to me, at some point or another, it's going to backfire on us. And I, you know, I just hope, as you said, what have we learned? We haven't. And at some point, hopefully, somebody will say, okay, time out, time out, time out, time out. We've yeah. got to change direction. But I, I'm not... Unfortunately, I'm not very optimistic yet at this point. I, I'm i not either. I've tried to be mm-hmm. because, you know, I, I grew up in that little hippie town and you took care of each other. And when someone was sick, you donated food, you raised money, and it's just... I know we could have a better world if we chose to. That's why I'm just always hoping that, you know, yeah. Brooks, you know, countries are joining Brooks that um, we change through Brooks. You have all the victims of the United States together. Yeah. Well, and then there's our own victims here, as we said before, too. 
you know, there are our own victims here. Mm -hmm. We're spending, what is it now, $66 billion or $80 billion has, has been shipped to Ukraine. What could that $80 billion have done here? What about the, the subsidizing rents? What about single-payer health care? What about fixing the fixing bridges and streets and i mean the, the the money that's being poured into violence and destruction yeah uh, it could really go a long way yes yes and they don't want the powers they don't want it. they want to have people struggle as well there's always got to be hardship and struggle Mm -hmm. you know, they won't ask people won't ask stuff they're so busy working and struggling and I mean that narrative and when um, they do ask I've heard as well. and when I do see people ask they get the third degree about why they're not working or why they don't have enough money I mean we honestly treat each other very badly in this country mm -hmm. and I see you know, I see it when people are on Facebook saying, you know, if anybody could help me out with a little bit of groceries. Mm -hmm. Well, why don't mm -hmm. you go to the food bank? Because my work hours, I can't make it there. Well, if you work, why don't you have food? Mm -hmm. Maybe you should get another job. I mean... We see that all the time. Well, the, I don't, well, I it. haven't seen the numbers lately, but mutual aid groups really started to grow in number during the pandemic. They have. It became very clear very quickly that if people were going to survive through this, through the pandemic, People would have to help each other out because the government wasn't going to do it. Um, yeah. And I don't know. I hope that that uh, continues because, you know, we, <laughs> the government, just remember, I just remember all the fights at the beginning over raising the minimum wage, for goodness sakes, something that hasn't been raised since 2009. You know, and trying to get it to fifteen dollars an hour when it was first called for in two thousand and nine. In two thousand and nine, fifteen dollars an hour might have been, might have, might have helped a little bit, a, a little bit. But now, fifteen dollars an hour with inflation and all the rest of it is going backwards. You know, yeah. um, and, and we've had some mutual. Sorry, go ahead, Dolores. Intentionally making people struggle. Mm -hmm. yeah. Because the government has the ability to appropriate funding for anything mm -hmm. they want. It's a choice. It's a choice to have people struggling and creating hardship, creating yeah. stress. Mm -hmm. and my call to action is going to be that I want more people to pay attention to what's going on in their county and their state with the finances mm. than just paying attention to the national bickering back and forth or mm. whatever. More people really, you can have more of an effect mm -hmm. on what happens locally than you can nationally. And so to pay more attention, like one of the things that we've got that people are voting on right now is they were wanting to use some of the COVID funds that the county got to increase the size of the jail. And that's going oh. on all over the United States, yes, not is. just our area. Right. And then at the same time, some of the money that our state got, the governor sent back to the federal that could have gone to help people get caught up on rent that were behind due to illness or everything else.
or even making it a crime to feed the home feed homeless people. Yeah, or I pass mean, out water. Yeah, I, it's, the first time I saw that, I I nearly I didn't know what to make. I didn't know what to do. How can you? How could anybody do that? Mm -hmm. But I mean, I'm, I can answer my own question. It's a rhetorical question, but when you say, you know, it's we treat each other poorly, boy, are you ever correct on that? Um, uh, and the whole homeless issue is not even being addressed at all. No. Um, but we can ship billions of dollars to Ukraine for war. Um, there's something terribly wrong with that picture, terribly wrong. A friend of mine goes to a college in California, and she said there were something like 13,000 homeless students uh, last year. 13,000, and a lot of them will sleep in their cars in the parking lot um, in order to get, uh, to get what passes for an education. Uh, this is this is madness. It is. It is, and it's sad. It's madness. There's no reason for it. There's no reason for it at all. I don't know. So you have the what? I would it's a love, choice I, I don't the U.S. Yeah. yeah. I just, I cannot imagine the thought process. And that's what frustrates me so much about the, the whole politics, politicians. I don't understand their thought process. Hmm. Hmm. You know, my brother-in-law brought up a great point when we were talking about politics, obviously. And um, he had said the average person, the person who's running for politics is the person that makes, say, under 80000 a year. There should be a limit on how much you make so that you can recognize community and recognize what people are going through in the community and the struggles that people Putting rich people in office, they are so separate. And, you know, there should, because we've been talking about how things are different from how it started. You know, it was supposed to be just a few years, you know, and then have somebody else. You know, it was supposed to be the same person staying in, in rich and being separated from the community that uh, they represent. And not understand hardship. If you have people in that understand hardship, things would improve, things would be better. I would think anyway, soon. Yeah, I think I'm honestly good with getting rid of parties completely. I know yeah. why there's parties. It's so that you can build a base and work together, but they're not doing anything for us. So why get, you know, with the two-party system, we at least need four or five to choose from. Yeah, that's well, why. Now, we've got two yeah. corporations, and they shouldn't be corporations. Well, and as long as Donald Trump is out there, as long as the Democrats are using Donald Trump to, to, to promote themselves, as you said just a little uh, while ago, Brandy, it's an enormous distraction from the real economic mm -hmm. issues that exist because, you know, I, I saw people writing about the cancer that is Trump. And I mean, a lot of this stuff, a lot of what happened with Trump and a lot, there are a lot of things to criticize, but yeah. there are also a lot of things to criticize about Joe Biden. And there's a lot yeah. to criticize about the leadership, so-called leadership of this country and who they side with, who they're trying to work for, who they're working for, and who they're leaving out. And as long as it's just this back and forth, Trump this, 
Biden. And I, I'm seeing, you know, competing rallies, Trump and Biden. Didn't we just go through this, you know, in 20, yeah. in 2020? What's, what are we doing this? Why are we still doing this? Or it was Trump, Biden, and then before that, it was Hillary Clinton and Trump. And then, you know, and then Zbigniew Z Z Z Brzezinski, whom I mentioned earlier, he was a part of that whole team for all those years, national, so-called national security advice. It's the same people just putting a little, a different hat on, you know, and, mm -hmm. and they're distracting others. They're distracting people from what the real issues are. Yeah, the things that I hear from Democrats, I sat there and told them multiple times, Republicans say the same thing. You're mm -hmm. not coming up with anything new. They say the same thing about you guys that you say about them. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. And so, yeah. And the state of Israel and the occupation, going back to where we started, there is probably not even, well, there's Rashida Tlaib, Il Ilhan Omar, others who speak out again about Israel, and but the overwhelming number of politicians, you know, are pro-Israel, pro-Israel occupation, don't speak out against the human rights violations that occur on a daily basis. And, and that's so, big. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. No, that's fine. Go ahead. I was going to say a lot of that's because if they don't publicly support Israel, whoever runs against them will get funding from APAC. Mm -hmm. Massive. Yes. And we brought that up, I think, one other episode near the end that Israel is the country that interferes the most in our government. Mm. More than Russia has ever even thought of. Yeah. Exactly. And forbid you say anything about Israel, but you can say anything about Russia or any other country. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Exactly. And then we have to we have to get to the key. We have to get to the source of where a lot of this is where a lot of well, who said it? To to find out who controls you, you find out what you can't talk about or who mm -hmm. you can't talk about. And that's where we are. And until we are able to open up that that whole area, um, I I would have I I I wish I wonder if there are any speeches of Fatima Barnawi anywhere. And she it sounds like she was less active later on. And social media and video was easily accessible. Yeah. But I would have loved to hear her speak and see how she inspired people. Um, I was looking too. I was looking for a video of her and couldn't find it. Yeah. yeah, it was in the days before all the social media. She definitely is an inspiration. She's an inspiration to all of us. Mm -hmm. Agreed. Agreed. And Brent, we're going to be putting a show soon, doing a show soon with Brady um, with also what's happening in Arkansas. With Israel, I um, with communication. I can't hear you. Oh, yeah, what's, that, what's going on? Arkansas? Oh, I still couldn't hear you. Can you hear me now? Up. Yeah. And now I can. I couldn't hear you either. Mm. Okay, Arkansas, um, with Israel, and you are going to bring a guest on the show and talk about that a bit. Arkansas? Oh, you have Israel. Oh. You can't talk about it. Oh, yeah, that's going to be, I've got to get that stuff pulled up tomorrow. So that when we try to do that sometime this week, 
there's actually a lawsuit going on by a journalist in Arkansas. It may be heard by the Supreme Court in the next year or two, because back in 2017, they passed a bill Mm. in the federal government saying that you could not refuse to trade with Israel. You could not, you weren't supposed to say anything bad about them, everything. And it goes against our First Amendment. So a journalist from the Arkansas Democrat Gazette is suing. Oh, really? Mm hmm. And it's already made it up to where it's basically up to the Supreme Court if they decide to hear the case or not. U.S. Supreme Court or Arkansas mm-hmm. Supreme? No, U.S. U.S. Because there's a similar law. There's a similar law in New Jersey that, and I, I and a number of other people I remember on a very very hot summer's day, we were standing out in a on a busy highway next to a state legislator's office, uh, protesting uh, th- that law, basically. And it was a bipartisan bill. Let mm. me find it real quick. Oh, I'm we really go. curious to know how that all plays out. Yeah, I think we're going to be hearing it within probably the next year or two. I think we'll hear, I think it'll be heard before the next election because mm. of the Supreme Court that we currently have. Mm. Hmm. I think it's very possible. I'm looking for it right now. So yeah, they've actually made federal laws against speech and that your personal business, you cannot refuse to do business with Israel. Here it is. Any other country you can use, but not Israel. No, no, yeah. no. And it's as if the government, even at a state level with a similar bill to that, it's as if the government is sitting in uh, the board, you know, the board of trustees, um, the board of directors meetings of these corporations saying, no, 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 no. You'd think that more people would be upset about that. Yeah, this was S-720, the Israel Anti-Boycott Act. Hmm. So... This bill declares that Congress opposes the United Nations Human Rights Council resolution of March 24, 2016, which urges countries to pressure companies to divest from or break contracts with Israel and encourages full implementation of the Israel United States Israel Strategic Partnership Act of 2014, Mm -hmm. enhance government-wide coordinated with U.S., Israel, scientific and technological civilian areas. So this bill amends the Export Administration Act of 1979 to declare that it shall be U.S. policy to oppose requests by foreign countries to impose restrictive practices or boycotts against other countries friendly to the United States, or that U.S. persons and restrictive trade practices or boycotts fostered or imposed by an international government organization or requests to impose such practices or boycotts against Israel. The bill prohibits any U.S. person engaged in interstate or foreign commerce from supporting any request by a foreign country to impose any boycott against a country that is friendly with the United States and that is not itself the object of the form of any boycott. Any boycott fostered or imposed 
by an international government organization against Israel or any request by an international government organization to impose the boycott. And most people don't even know that that's current sitting law. Now, when was it passed, Brandy? Um, it says 2017, 2018. Um, wow. It was sponsored by S Senate Cardin, Benjamin Cardin. Mm. A Democrat. <laughs> wow, I wasn't I wasn't aware of this national law. I, yeah, this is and most people aren't. I was aware That's of the state we, one, yeah, but not state one in New Jersey, not the one that was national. Yeah, you, is the vote there? Is the actual? what the actual vote was is that also on that set on that site it should be because this is the congress.gov yes and so, um this is of course the senate side but um this shows this is republicans and democrats yeah yeah I would be surprised if there were more than 10 anti 10, 10 votes against. Yeah. Hmm. The only co-sponsor that withdrew from it was Senator Gillibrand. Hmm. But this was brought to my attention by another local, a local anti-war activist who's been doing it for since probably the beginning of the Iraq war, you know, mm -hmm. he's close to my age and he's been doing it for at least 20 years mm. here in red state, Arkansas, anti-war, anti-nuclear activist. Um, he shared mm -hmm. the story of the lawsuit and it's an Arkansas Democrat Gazette journalist that's suing. Well, now that's inspirational also. Yeah, I know. <laughs> because he's like, the Supreme Court yeah. Does, takes a good look at it and doesn't just act along ideological lines. Yeah, that's the scary part because that is our First Amendment and this would basically set precedence. Hmm. Wow on that so but no i'm gonna have to get out of here me too and go get something to eat <laughs> but okay. i enjoyed Hello, getting to sir. visit with you too madeline again. yeah i like i enjoyed myself I, I think dolores thank you um and uh let me know when we'll have you back. When... Okay. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Love we'll it. be happy to have you back in each yeah. other, All right. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night to you both. And in the spirit of God and my last. Yeah. Thanks for being encouraged by her. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye-bye. Good night, everybody. So we just